Welcome back to Dirty Medicine's Dirty Biochemistry series. This video is part two of the mini series. And what I mean by that is that this is the follow-up video to the video that you probably just watched on the HMP shunt, also known as the pentose phosphate pathway. As I alluded to in the beginning of that video, this is the second part of a biochemical process that is very closely tied to the HMP shunt. As a quick refresher, in that part one of the HMP shunt video, we discussed how NADPH is generated by the HMP shunt. We talked about the one step that you should know, how it's generating NADPH, and that that NADPH would be very closely tied to what we're gonna talk about in this video in part two about glutathione reductase. Let's jump right into part two and complete your understanding of not only everything that we talked about with the HMP shunt, but also transition to glutathione and free radicals. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about glutathione reductase. Now this pathway has one goal and it's to reduce glutathione. Now sometimes this pathway is referred to as the glutathione pathway, other times it's referred to as the glutathione reductase pathway, but technically speaking, glutathione reductase is an enzyme. So it's a little silly to name a pathway after an enzyme. So if you hear me use the word glutathione reductase pathway or glutathione pathway or free radical pathway, I'm talking about the same thing. Okay, so this is the glutathione pathway, and its only goal is to reduce glutathione. Now, let me turn your attention to a slide that we had in the first video on, in the HMP shunt. We said that free radical detoxification requires reduced glutathione. So obviously, in this glutathione pathway, the reason that the goal is to reduce glutathione is to be able to process and detoxify free radicals and peroxides. Now, again, just to really complete the whole picture, it was free radical detoxification required reduced glutathione. And in this pathway, I'll show you how we actually reduce that glutathione. But that required NADPH, which came from the HMP shunt. So that is why all of these pathways are tied together. Now, here's what you need to know about the glutathione reductase pathway. So you start with oxidized glutathione, right? So you have glutathione, it's just existing in an oxidized form. But that's not good because the body, in order to make use of its normal physiologic biochemistry, needs it to be in its reduced form. So the enzyme that reduces oxidized glutathione to reduced glutathione is glutathione reductase. And I mean, how beautiful is this? Just look at the name of the enzyme, glutathione reductase or reducetase. So it's reducing glutathione. So it tells you that glutathione reductase is reducing glutathione. So it's once glutathione is in its reduced form that it can actually go ahead and carry out its true biochemical purpose. And that is to say that reduced glutathione will proceed to detox the body against free radicals and to detox the body against peroxide. Okay, so in this very simplified image, what you see is reduced glutathione positively converting peroxide into water and also in green text, handling free radical detoxification. So glutathione is a very potent free radical detoxifier, and it's the reduced form of glutathione that we need in order to protect the body against free radicals. So if you were half paying attention to anything in the first two years of medical school, you probably understand that free radicals are very serious, and it's when the body cannot process or detoxify those free radicals that cellular damage occurs. So again, if I can sort of take a step back and pause for just a second, what I'm telling you is that the glutathione pathway has one goal. It's to reduce glutathione. And that reduced glutathione will go on and chop up all the free radicals that could potentially cause really bad damage and disease in the human body. So that's the normal biochemistry. And again, that process of getting reduced glutathione depends on the HMP shunt. Now, let me tie this all together. In this step where the enzyme glutathione reductase is happening, NADPH is actually being converted back into NADP+. And this is interesting, right? Because I told you that the goal of this pathway was to reduce glutathione, but we need NADPH to do that. So we need an input of NADPH in order to reduce glutathione. So where do we get that input of NADPH? Well, this is the connection between the HMP shunt and the glutathione pathway. We're taking the NADPH that was generated here 
in the HMP shunt and we're plugging that NADPH in to the glutathione pathway and connecting these wheels, if you will. So what you see is constant spinning or constant wheels where these two pathways are interacting with one another in a very cyclical form. So what you're seeing on this slide is a very simplified version of the connection between the HMP shunt shown on the left and the glutathione reductase pathway shown on the right. To, one, to once again summarize, because I cannot stress enough how high yield this is, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase will take glucose 6-phosphate, which it stole from glycolysis, and convert it into 6-phosphoglucanolactone. The only reason that it's doing that is to spit out NADPH from NADP+. Then glutathione reductase sees that NADPH sitting there, and it goes, hmm, I need that NADPH in order to reduce glutathione. And reducing glutathione is of the utmost importance because, again, the body needs reduced glutathione in order to handle free radicals. So that it, the glutathione reductase will grab that NADPH that the HMP shunt generated, and it will use it to make reduced glutathione. And, of course, when it makes reduced glutathione, one of the end products that the glutathione pathway spits out is an NADP+, which the HMP shunt looks at and says, okay, now I'm gonna keep going. And you've got this cyclical wheel, if you will, that just keeps spinning. So this is the connection between the HMP shunt and the glutathione reductase pathway. Now, what happens if cells lack NADPH, right? That is to say, what happens if this wheel stops spinning because one of the inputs is no longer there? Well, I'm going to show you in purple what would happen. Let's say that you don't have NADPH. And for now, don't worry about why you don't have it. But if you don't have NADPH, then you get a decrease of reduced glutathione because glutathione reductase can only reduce glutathione if it also converts NADPH to NADP+. So a decrease of NADPH means a decrease in reduced glutathione. And of course, a decrease in reduced glutathione means an increase in oxidative stress. And this is really serious. When free radicals go unchecked and there's increased oxidative damage in the body, disease will occur. So the question is, what causes oxidative stress? Well, we've got a few different causes. There are sulfa drugs, the drug primaquine, infections or any kind of illness, nitrofurantoin, another antibiotic, and fava beans. Kind of random, I know, but fava beans. So how do you remember the causes of oxidative stress? Well, what I want you to remember is spin F or spin off. So instead of saying spin off, I say spin F, spin F. And the reason that spin F reminds me of these different causes of oxidative stress is that spinning is what a wheel does. And I remember the little wheel or the cyclical nature of the HMP shunt and the glutathione reducti reductase pathway. So again, how, how do you remember that this mnemonic correlates to oxidative stress? Well, I remember the spinning of the wheels in the HMP shunt and the glutathione pathway. Then I remember spin off and spin F, S for sulfa, P for primaquine, I for infection, N for nitrofurantoin, and F for fava beans. So these are the things that cause oxidative stress. And this is really significant because as we're going to see in just a moment, in certain people who lack an enzyme, these insults that cause more oxidative stress that the body could normally handle just fine will actually go unchecked and cause so much oxidative stress that you're gonna get really severe anemia. So let's come back to the question, what happens if cells lack NADPH? Well, let's talk about one major cause of that. So one way that cells can lack NADPH and be really susceptible to the agents that I just showed you on the last slide that cause significant oxidative stress is if you knock out glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So those who have a deficiency of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase obviously cannot generate NADPH from NADP+. And this is a problem because when we can't generate NADPH, glutathione reductase can't make reduced glutathione, and if we don't have reduced glutathione, you have oxidative damage from free radicals. So the very high yield disease that I'm talking about is a G6PD deficiency. Now, this is an X-linked recessive disease, and the findings we've already talked about, right? You can't make NADPH, so you get no reduced glutathione. No reduced glutathione means increased oxidative stress. So what else are really high-yield findings that you should be familiar with? Well, in a G6PD deficiency, you're going to see what's referred to 
as Heinz bodies. And Heinz bodies are just little clumps of denatured hemoglobin that are going to accumulate inside of a red blood cell. The more oxidative damage going on inside of a red blood cell means the more cellular components get damaged. So hemoglobin gets damaged and denatures into these little teeny balls that you can see inside of the RBC. That is referred to as a Heinz body. Now what happens next? Macrophages that are sequestered by the spleen will come out and say, huh, that's weird. What are those little denatured hemoglobin balls doing in the red blood cells? I need to get rid of them. Because after all, a macrophage's job is to eat foreign particles that should not be present in cells. So macrophages flump from the spleen will bite off little chunks of the red blood cell. And when it does that, all it's trying to do is get rid of that denatured hemoglobin, right? It's trying to get rid of the Heinz bodies. But in doing so, it leaves what are called bite cells. So bite cells, as the name implies, are literally when macrophages from the spleen take bites out of the red blood cells. Now this is an attempt by the body just to undergo phagocytic clearance. Right? All it wants to do is clear out the Heinz bodies, but in doing so, it's breaking the red blood cells and literally taking a bite out of it. So again, big picture, take a step back and pause for a second. Anybody who does not have the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase has by definition a G6PD deficiency. This is an X-linked recessive disease where you lack the key enzyme in the HMP shunt that usually generates NADPH. If you can't generate NADPH and therefore can't make reduced glutathione and therefore can't handle oxidative damage from free radicals in the body, then you're very susceptible to hemolysis when your red blood cells undergo oxidative damage. And it's from those agents that we talked about in the SPIN-F pneumonic that could possibly introduce oxidative stress because those agents are oxidizing in nature. Now again, normally a, a regularly functioning person with this enzyme would be able to handle that stress with no problem. But in those who are deficient in this enzyme, that oxidative insult gets really out of control and you can get really profound anemia. So if on your exam you see a vignette where all of a sudden somebody eats a, a random bean, right, a fava bean, and they undergo labs or a clinical picture that looks like severe hemolysis, this is your answer. If somebody's started on an antibiotic such as nitrofurantoin or a sulfa drug of any class, and all of a sudden, they're having anemia, this is your answer. It's especially high yield to know these pictures because instead of describing what I just said in the clinical vignette, they could very literally just show you Heinz bodies, the denatured hemoglobin, or the bite cells, the attempt at the splenic macrophages to clean up those Heinz bodies and expect you to know the pathophysiology that we're talking about. So as you can see, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency is a very high yield biochemical disease. Now, how do you remember all this stuff, right? I've just given you a ton of information. And if anybody has watched any of my videos, you guys know that I don't want to overwhelm you. And my only concern is that you do really well on test day. So I've got a really awesome dirty medicine mnemonic to remember all of this stuff. So when I say G6PD deficiency, or when I think about a G6PD deficiency, I think about 6GPD. So I just kind of reorder it a little bit. Instead of G6PD, I think of 6GPD. And what that reminds me of is the number six Gorder Pounder. So if you've ever gone to a Burger King, McDonald's, whatever, you can order, you know, the number one, the number two, the number four, the number six, whatever. And they have Quarter Pounders, right? That's a burger in the United States. So I think about Gorder Pounder. So instead of quarter, I just change that Q to a G. So my mnemonic is take a bite of the number six Gorder Pounder, or Quarter Pounder, if you will, with Heinz ketchup right? Heinz is the like number one ketchup brand in the United States. So take a bite of the number six Gorder Pounder with Heinz ketchup. What does this tell you? Well, bite for bite cells, 6GPD for G6PD, and Heinz ketchup for Heinz body. So this is giving you all the high yield associations and tying it in to the disease. So this is it, guys. This is the slide you need to keep in mind. This is the big picture, right? The combination of the HMP shunt working in tandem in this um, cyclical way where the wheel keeps spinning, working with the glutathione pathway. Again, the common goal here is to handle free radical and oxidative damage. But individually, the HMP shunt generates NADPH and the glutathione reductase pathway reduces glutathione. It keeps on working together. There's this beautiful synergy here. 
And this is the biochemistry that you absolutely need to know. This is very, very high yield. And I think that I've done a good job of explaining it. So watch this video a few times if you need to. But if you're comfortable with all of this material, then you'll be able to answer most, if not all of your questions on USMLE and Comlex.